So good afternoon. Um, Mike Works. Good afternoon. So <clears throat> I'm Ken Kuke. I'm the data editor of The Economist. Uh, let me first make a first few thanks. Uh, it is great to be here, as it always is at Salzburg. It's those of us who admire its values and respect its heritage, um, it's always a wonderful place to be here, to social network, as Georg says, to be together. And I thank Stephen for that, in particular, for the great community that you've created under your leadership. I'm proud to have been here in multiple contexts and to address you today. Second thing, to Bill Etchickson. There he is. As some of you know, he was one of my earliest editors, and I want to tell you a short story, and it goes like this. <laughs> yes. Um, when you're about a 26-year-old journalist and you're asked to edit something, that is like giving uh, weapons of mass destruction to a madman. <laughs> to be an editor, to take copy, and to be able to make changes, this was great. And Bill trusted me to do that, and, uh, and I appreciate it, particularly because one time, uh, one evening, he said, he certainly doesn't remember this, he says, can you edit this? It was uh, Vaclav Havel's essay. We have to publish it, but it's a little bit long. Just take some of the fat out and we'll go with it. And I said, sure, <laughs> sounds great. I mean, as a 26-year-old in Paris, what else do you do but edit Vaclav Havel? So you know, I am well aware he is a writer, but look, all, all editors, all writers need good editors, and I'm 26 years old, so Lord knows I should be able to do an adequate job. So I did it, and of course, as you can imagine, the tools in my hand were so powerful, I couldn't resist. And suddenly, what Havel said wasn't quite right, so I made a tweak here and a tweak there. By the end, it was as much Ken Kuki as it was Vaclav Havel. And I respect uh, Bill for two things. The first thing, he looked at it and he said, okay, well, you know, I see what you did and I can understand why that's not so bad, but I think actually the original version wasn't quite as bad as I'm okay with. And he said, he said something to me, he said, let's, I, he understood what I was doing, he said, let's let Vaclav Havel be Vaclav Havel. Right? <laughs> and I always remember that because what you should know is that that's the sort of in my mind as an editor now whenever I have to work on copy, I always think to myself, it's not what I would say, but let's let Vaclav Havel be Vaclav Havel. So thank you, Bill. Good. There is a lot of information in the world today, and it is growing at a very, very fast pace. The good news is we can do new things with it than we could never do before, and the bad news is it leaves us in a whole new perilous environment with which society is unprepared. Let me start and tell a story about this, but first let me tell you what I'm going to try to do and why my mission is impossible. The mission's impossible is because I've got three presentations that I'm going to try to fit into one. The first presentation is to tell you what is big data. You're going to hear about the term if you haven't already. I'm going to try to give you a sense of what's going on. The second thing I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to explain social networking, which Stephen asked me to do in the context of big data, building on what Georg has said and building on what has been said already. That's the important thing because that's the third thing that I'm going to try to do. I've been listening with what was said last night in terms of the audience participation and today, and I've been adapting my presentation at great risk and peril for making it larger and longer uh, based on what we've been talking about. So I've got that third element responding to some of the things we've been raising, in particular, education and media. So the story goes like this. What does it look like today? What is big data? And how does the world work today? And how will it work tomorrow? What's going on here? What's new? So. Here's what's new. If you go to a doctor today and you get an x-ray, he's going to look at the x-ray and he's going to, uh, you know, I see your uh, Dr. Omen is looking and trying to diagnose. It's not me. He's like, what's going on? But what he's doing right now is he's looking and he's basing it on years of experience. He remembers medical school and he's thinking about what he learned from his professors and passed that light on of torch of knowledge. He's thinking about his experience and years of wisdom based on looking how things practically work. You know, it's not always what's in the textbook. It's the latent knowledge that we can see that took 25, 30, in your case, 140 years to, to develop and to learn and to figure out. And that's basically how knowledge works today. It's highly useful. It's highly imperfect. We see the results of that. What it does mean is that a radiologist might have, let's say, 5,000, let's say 10,000 cases by the time they're in their mid-60s and able to you know, build upon all of their wisdom that they've had. They're able to make a decision based on that. It might be right, it might be wrong. Sometimes they call in another person. What if, what if we were to take every single x-ray that had ever been taken in America for the last 30 years and take every single diagnosis based on that x-ray that a human person had done and correlate it. First thing we want to do is we also want to find out what was the outcome? 
was the diagnosis correct or not? When they said it was cancerous, was it? Was it very cancerous and they thought it was just slightly? Or was, was, were they completely wrong? And what if we could make lots of inferences about it? And so what we could do is not try to teach the computer in terms of artificial intelligence, teach the computer these are the rules from the textbook or from my wisdom of what is a cancer or what is not, but let the machine develop a, st a statistical model, a probabilistic model of what is cancer, what is not, and to infer it. A human being might be able to keep it, might have, you know, 25 kind of rules that they have as a radiologist when they're reading it, and maybe by the time they're 70 or 65, we'll say, um, at the end of their career, that 25 is now 50, and they weighed it differently. They're not even aware that they're doing it. They couldn't even articulate it if they wanted to. But why stop at 50? Maybe we could come up with a model in which there's 106 different predictors, all with vastly different weights, of what something is cancerous or what is not. Basically, what the world is going to look like in big data is that we're going to have machines doing some of these things for us. It's not to say that the human being will be replaced. It's that the human being will be augmented, similar to the way that a pilot lands a plane today by flipping on autopilot, but then has to be in full command of the craft at the same time. That essentially is sort of what big data is, but it's not just happening in, the, in medicine, it's not happening in sciences. Full disclosure, it's actually not happening yet today. This is the vision, but the fact is we're seeing small aspects of it, um, particularly in business and particularly in internet businesses today in terms of machine learning. As, a, as an aside, the way that translation works in the past was teaching a machine the rules of a word in English and a word in Russian, and that would be the way it is. Now, as, as Bill can, would attest, Google has, you know, is able to translate about 60 languages um, simply by looking at the probability that one word is the right word for another by going throughout the entire internet and looking at how the structure of languages of very good high quality translations. The Google Book program does that as well. Um, looking at all of the EU documents, instead of looking at millions of pages, they're looking at billions of pages and making these inferences. The point here is that in business, what we're finding out is that the data is a new raw material of business, it is a new form of economic value, and it, the technology is possible and the data exists, but it's really about a shift in mindset. Big data, if you will, is things that you can see at a large scale that you can't see at a small one to unlock new sources of value, to get new insights. We have a lot of information. What does a lot of information mean? Well, this is what it means. Uh, in 1986, uh, the digital society barely existed. We sort of know that. What's not quite so well known is that in terms of analog storage versus digital storage down here, um, by the year 2000, it was still about you know, you know, four to one, five to one. It was only about one fifth of the amount of information in the world was digital. That should be very humbling uh, for all of us here, because many of us remember the year 2000, year 2000 bug, uh, and we, were, we thought we were participating in the information society, but not really. It took a little bit longer for the information society to get its name. The crossover point was about 2003, this data is from 2007, the digital information there. The digital information doubles every three years, so you can see that that small little gray point at the very top is now going to be half as big this year and probably half as big again in two years from now, and that's the way the world is going. There's lots of different traits to big data, and I don't have time to discuss them. So I'm not even going to discuss why it's predictive, nor am I going to discuss why it's recursive. Okay, I will. So let's say I was going to type in the name of the head of the Salzburg Institute, and I type in uh, Stephen's name, and I mistype it. Well, Google is going to correct the fact that I've made a mistake. Now, let me, let's think about this for a second. Nobody told Google that this was the correct spelling or not. It knew, and it knew on its own. Why? Because it treats information as signals. We know that markets rely on information. We know it's because of the price signal, but we don't think that everything that we do can be informational. Everything we do can be dataized, and essentially everything can be a signal with which we can do new things. Google has the world's best spell checker in every language simply by recycling the misspellings of everyone else's search query and then where they click and what they meant to type. So Google knows when you've misspelled something. Microsoft's spelling dictionary is based on someone having to think, you know, this is the right spelling for Salzburg with a U and not an E, but it had to be explicitly and overtly trained. The world that we're walking into is where the data is able to be harnessed and to speak with the right algorithms to unleash such great new value, if you will. This is an informational product 
based on user clicks. It's basically recycling the byproduct, the interactions with which people are working with the service. This has profound implications. So let's think about some of the opportunities in terms of social networking. In terms of finance, right now, if you wanted to know if I'm going to repay my loan or not, you might get my FICO score from a credit agency. But what if I told you that a better predictor, whether I repaid my loan or not, was not what a credit agency said, but what Facebook said, because the better predictor is whether my friends pay back loans if I do as well. Suddenly, the value of Facebook and its lofty share price, despite having stumbled recently, uh, looks, it looks a lot more appealing. Right? Because what one company did, by trying to overtly think about it, Facebook might have just by the traces of data that it holds. Let's take a look at education for a moment. Okay, so we've been thinking about what will uh, a world of social networking, what a world of online education look like, what will that mean? We've thought about it in the ability to reach many more students than ever before. Here's an arresting figure for you. Uh, right now, uh, there's professors at MIT and Harvard that are working to teach a class this fall in computer science. And while they were looking, and they were getting sign-ups okay, for their online class, it's an online class, they realized that they had gotten more sign-ups to their class than MIT has given a degree in the history of the institution. So what does it mean for the future of education? What does it mean for the future of economic development or opportunities for people around the world that that's going to be the case? Let me press the point a little bit more because many of you are educators. So there is a professor of, uh, many of this is happening first in computer science because that's where a lot of the activity is and the action is and interest is. So there is a professor uh, of computer science at Stanford named um, uh, Thrun, uh, Stefan Thrun. And he uh, taught a class last fall on artificial intelligence. He had 160,000 students. Okay. Stanford didn't really know about what he was doing. They might not have liked it. But he taught it in parallel online as well as to his Stanford students. He had 200 Stanford students. How many Stanford students were in the top 100 of the class at the end of the class? What number? Throw one out. 160. The number would be zero. 200. Zero. 411. The first Stanford student was ranked 411. If you were the provost of, St of Stanford, you would have said, bring me Dr. Thrun, put him behind a wall, and shoot him. <laughs> right? I mean, what does it mean to be Stanford and to give this degree out? Right? What it does mean, I think I'm very excited about this, is that it means great opportunities for people around the world to get great educations. It also means that what it means to be a university is what we've always known but never really made explicit, which is it's not as much about you and interacting with, your, with the material and with the professor, but you interacting with the other students. It's about the context that you're in. It's with the people that you're in, the, the social networking, as Georg said, that you're making. And, and the benefits of the university system is going to really have to change and have to sell itself on that experience rather than simply the education. My last point to this is that how you're using data in new ways. First one, when you have an online class, the professor can see if people are going to actually, let me actually not distract you with that for a second. When you have an online class, you can actually look at every single interaction, treat it as a signal with which you can learn from, and then redesign your class to make it better. So what one professor has done is he's, he's looked at every single time a student has clicked on the video and then stopped the video, paused it, and gone back. To him, it tells him either it's something that he's taught where he's not being particularly clear, or maybe it's really, really good, and you know, it's, it's a funny joke and people want to you know, see it again. This is a kind of performance-based learning that was impossible, pedagogically speaking, in the past. It gets better. He's looking at the numbers, he's looking at the data, and he realizes people are going through the course, and by around class eight, eight, nine, the all, you know, many of them, maybe one third of them, are going back to class three. What's going on, right? He finds out it's a review class where, for one of the prerequisites of linear algebra. He's like, wow, I'm learning that the students don't feel confident with their math ability, and they only find that out three weeks later that I go back. I now know how to readapt the course for this. 
here's the best one. He gets a homework back and he realizes that there's some mistakes, right? Maybe one class, you know, half the class gets it right, half the class gets it wrong. You as professors do this all the time, you know that. How about this? He sees that 2,000 students get an answer wrong and produce the exact same answer. Suddenly, he thinks to himself, let's find out what's going on. Right? So he, has, he builds a little algorithm to, do, to look into it, and he finds out, oh, they're inverting an, an algebraic equation, thinking that it's actually, can, you can do A, B, or B, A, but actually, no, the sequence matters. So now, when you it, load up your homework, when you upload it, and you do that, and you make the mistake, it doesn't say you got it wrong. It says, uh, there's a small problem here. Maybe you should redo this. Here's a hint. Right? Again, it changes the nature of education. He was able to see the sort of visibility that, you would, that educators were just not able to see before. Here's how they did some statistical model, and I will not bore you with it. In media, the same thing is happening. We've been talking about this for a while as well. I wanted to show um, a beautiful word cloud that Lena in Jordan had created, but instead I couldn't find it online because my Arabic skills are not what they should be. But this is from The Economist, and what it's showing, it's in this current issue that's out today, is, um, is how we're actually in the media able to use data in new ways to, prevent, to present new stories. What this is are the kings of Saudi Arabia. You can see from 1950 to today, and you can see the ages from the start of their reign and until they passed away and their successor took over, and the median age of the population, and you can see the disjunction there. This is a way of visualizing something that was always around, but we never thought to visualize before. Now we're doing this. What Lena and Jordan did was very clever as well. When a new government forms in Jordan, the king writes a letter to present the new government that they can then take. It's sort of a, it's honorific. It's the flowery language that in law we call dicta. It just means nothing. It's just, you know, we welcome you and present you with all the flowering stuff. But he, of course, says some great nice words. And what she did is she looked at the frequency of the words that were used. And she found out that for an entire decade, the word reform stayed there. And so you could actually see, you know, visually, if you're a Jordanian, that in fact the clap trap of this great wish of reform, but suddenly after a terrible, uh, terrible uh, bombing at a hotel in Amman, that it changed. The word reform was no longer there. Now it's words like, you know, the nation and patriotism, and you can make inferences. NGOs are also finding it very useful as well. In this is you're looking at how NGOs are raising money through new platforms with which social networking allows people to fund them, that they can interact with, their, with the people whom they want to you know, keep as their supporters, and they can do new things with it. It's about the connectivity that they bring to them. It's about the link. It's about the social network, if you will, to create that community of interest and to harness them for great, powerful reasons. In this case, it's fundraising. There's a big idea behind all of that, and it's this. Looking at Lena's uh, slides at the very beginning and where you were watching the, hashtag, the hashtag, hashtag debate, I think a lot of us, I mean, I felt very inspired by it. I was swelling up the sense that, my God, this is how democratic participation is happening. It's happening in a whole other sphere, and it doesn't look like it's political, but of course, as we know, it is, and of course, we have crown princes there to prove it. And it reminded me of the normal Rockwell poster of the sort of every man at the town hall who's speaking his mind. And that's the, that's the spirit of democracy. This is a map that was created not by the government of Japan, but by a, a private sector group called Faircast, going around, creating, giving Geiger counters to ordinary people to take measurements to find out exactly what's going on. They have a lot more credibility than any institution in Japan. And of course, in terms of media and how it's being, what's being produced from it, we can lament that modern media uh, doesn't have the financial capabilities to do what we did before in terms of, um, in terms of uh, investigative reporting and other things. But we have to really understand that, as Churchill said, if you're faced with a problem and there's no known solution, maybe it's not a problem at all, but a new reality to live with, I would suggest that this is simply the new normal and we have to get used to it. It doesn't need to be as terrible as we think. Um, ProPublica is an NGO, it's a nonprofit organization that did dedicated to, to, journal, to investigative journalism. Huffington Post is not. It is a very markedly for-profit organization that seems to be what's called a content aggregator and a little bit like a tabloid. Both of them, so you, so you have the traditional model of the New York Times and the Economist and Washington Post, 
we know what that is. And now you have an NGO on one side and you have a, a tabloid on another. Both of these have won Pulitzers in the last two years. Okay, so they're doing something right. So although we might criticize social networking when it comes to media in lots of ways, and it's open to criticism, and I share it, and I criticize them too, we also have to recognize that there's more to the story than just that. What are the rules with which we uh, regulate this new universe that we're in? Bill yesterday uh, told us that just because we have more information doesn't mean that the rules with which we regulate ourselves need to change. I would actually say that I don't think that's true. I think that actually if you have not just a lot more information, but a lot more information, it doesn't mean that more is just more, it means that more can also be different. That a change of scale leads to a change of state. That a quantitative change can lead to a qualitative change. We know what a photo looks like, and then you take a photograph and you speed it up so there's 24 frames per second and it looks like a movie. And we agree that a movie looks different than a still photograph. So too in the world of big data, when we have so much more information, I would believe that the rules need to change as well. Keep in mind that, the, that before the printing press, there were no free speech laws, right? It took 300 years after the invention of movable type before we had the world's free speech laws. When Socrates drank the hemlock, he didn't avail himself in the Apologia on free speech grounds because it didn't exist. So what will the new rules be? I've got some views, but you're going to have to buy the book. Again, Stephen said, I'm not going to give it all away to you. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but bear with me just simply to say that here's what I think the vision of the world is going to look like. We're going to have sensors everywhere. There's going to be trillions of them. They're going to be recording everything. Um, we can talk on the panel about the positive and negative about those things. But when you think about it, it's going to be us who are going to be the sensors. We're going to be measured. And it means that it's, we're going to be a whole new infrastructure. It means that it's going to come quicker than we think. We're very unprepared, and I look forward to seeing how it ends. Thank you very much. Thank you.